So welcome to unit 10 personality. Um, these slides are, they align with Meyer psychology for the AP, <laughs> Meyer psychology for the AP course third edition. They're the lecture slides that go with the textbook. And today I'm going to be going over module 55, psychoanalytic and psychodynamic theories. So there are three learning targets for this module. Explain what psychologists mean by the term personality and identify the theories that inform our understanding of personality. Explain how Sigmund Freud, you guys have probably heard about him, um, about how his treatment of psychological disorders led to his view of the unconscious mind and uh, describe his view of personality. And then identify the developmental stages Freud proposed and discuss how he thought people defended themselves against anxiety. Um, actually, there are more than three. There are six. <laughs> um, I messed up. Uh, identify which of Freud's ideas his followers accepted and rejected. Describe projective te tests and how they are used and discuss some criticisms of them. And finally, this is a pretty long module, discuss how contemporary psychologists view Freud's psychoanalysis and describe how modern research has developed our understanding of the unconscious. So what is personality? Term we use all the time in the popular culture, but what do we mean by it when we're thinking about it from a psychological perspective? Well, it's defined as an individual's characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. Our personality is what drives what we laugh at, who we hang out with, how we occupy our time, why we cry, and even things like where we choose to live. Our personality underlies all that makes us, us really. You know, it is what makes us who we are, our personality. So what theories inform our understanding of personality? Psychoanalytic or psychodynamic theories propose that childhood sexuality and unconscious things we're not really aware of, motivations influence personality. Humanistic theories, and when we're thinking about psychoanalysis, psychodynamic thinking, Freud, um, Adler, Jung, humanistic theories focused on our inner capacity for growth and self-fulfillment. Okay, so thinking Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Trait theories examine characteristic patterns of behavior, okay? And social cognitive theories explore the interaction between people's traits, including their thinking and social context. So this guy you probably have seen before. Um, this is Sigmund Freud, one of the most famous uh, names in the field of psychology. Um, although he technically wasn't a psychologist. Uh, psychodynamic theories of personality view human personality as a dynamic interaction between the conscious mind and unconscious mind including associated motives and conflicts. So how are psychodynamic theories related to psychoanalysis? So the psychodynamic theories are descended from Freud's psychoanalysis and his theory that proposed that childhood sexuality and unconscious motivations what really are the big influencers on our personality. So how did this come about? How did Freud's treatment of these disorders lead to his view of the unconscious mind? So in treating patients whose disorders had no clear physical explanation, Freud concluded these problems reflected unacceptable thoughts and feelings. And he thought they were hidden away. These unacceptable thoughts and feelings were buried deep with inside um, an individual's unconscious mind. And that was what was influencing um, the, the patient to be feeling whatever sort of anxiety or depression or whatever sort of manifestation that they were having at that time. So for instance, Freud speculated that lost feelings in one's hand might be caused by a fear of touching one's genitals, that unexplained blindness or deafness might be caused by not wanting to see or hear something that aroused, <clears throat> excuse me, intense anxiety. <clears throat> So what is the unconscious? Well, according to Freud, the unconscious is a reservoir. I like to think about that, visualize it, of our mostly unacceptable thoughts, wishes, feelings, and memories. To un explore the unconscious, Freud uh, used free association and dream analysis. So free association is a method of exploring the uncon unconscious in which the person relaxes and says whatever comes to mind, no matter how trivial it might seem or how embarrassing it might be. And Freud's view of the mind is depicted often utilizing an image of an iceberg. It's a good way to visualize what Freud was thinking in terms of um, 
his idea of the mind that you know he wanted to to make it clear that the mind is mostly hidden beneath the conscious service surface so down here that unconscious energy we're going to talk a little bit about ego id uh, and super ego um, as well shortly but the unconscious mind is hidden below the surface and only the tip of the iceberg is in our conscious thoughts our conscious mind so basic to Freud's theory was his belief that the mind is mostly hidden, as I just said, our conscious awareness, like the part of that, that tip of the iceberg is the part that floats above the surface. Beneath that awareness is the unconscious mind that has our thoughts, wishes, feelings, and our memories. So of greater interest to Freud was the mass than the, than the conscious stuff was the mass of unacceptable passions and thoughts that he thought we repress or force inside of ourselves, block from coming to conscious awareness because they would be too unsettling to us. He believed that without our awareness, these unconscious, troublesome feelings and ideas influence us without us even knowing it, um, sometime gaining expression in disguised forms. You know, maybe the work we choose, <clears throat> excuse me, the beliefs we hold, our daily habits, or even ups upsetting symptoms that we might be manifesting. So what was, what was his belief about human personality? He believed that human personality, including emotions and desires, arise from this conflict between impulse, our basic impulse, and our ability to restrain ourselves, between our aggressive, pleasure-seeking, biological urges, and our internalized social controls over these urges. Think about that, like on one shoulder, we've got that devil, and on one shoulder, we've got that angel. You see that in a lot of cartoons, kind of controlling us. Um, and we're trying to try to balance out those different urges. <clears throat> Excuse me. Freud believed personality arises from our efforts to resolve this basic conflict, to express these impulses in ways that bring satisfaction without also bringing guilt or punishment. So to understand the mind's dynamics during this conflict, Freud proposed three interacting systems that are, that are in this visual right here on the iceberg. The id the ego and the super ego. These are three terms that we're gonna to wanna to know. So the id, what is that? Strange word, right? A reservoir of our unconscious psychic energy according that, according to Freud, strives to satisfy our basic drives, our sexual and aggressive drives. The id operates on what's called the pleasure principle. It is demanding immediate gratification. The id wants you to gratify your needs immediately. Then there's the ego, which is the largely conscious executive part of personality that according to Freud mediates the demands of the id, the superego, and reality. The ego operates on what we call the reality principle, satisfying the id's desires and the superego's restraint in ways that will realistically bring pleasure rather than pain. Then we have the superego. This is the part of the personality that represents our ideals. It provides standards for judgment. It's our conscience. And it you know, you know, helps us think about our future aspirations. So because the superego's demands often oppose the id's, the ego struggles to reconcile the two. And you can see the angel and devil image right there as well. The ego is the personality executive. It mediates between the impulsive demands of the id and the restraining de demands of the superego and the real life demands of the external world. So Freud believed that children pass through a series of psychosexual stages during which the id's pleasure-seeking energies focus on distinct pleasure-sensitive areas of the body he called erogenous zones. And you can see these different stages right here where the oral stage, where the focus is pleasure centers around the mouth with a you know, young baby, early toddler, and then um, into like preschool years, pleasure focuses on bowel and bladder elimination, coping with demands for control. And then the, the shift focus to pleasure zone in the genitals, coping with incestuous sexual feelings, um, then latency, a phase of dormant sexual feelings, and then the genital stage, maturation of sexual interests. So the Oedipus complex. Freud believed that during the phallic stage, for example, boys develop both unconscious sexual desires for their mother and jealousy and hatred for their father, whom they consider a rival. These feelings, he thought, lead boys to feel guilty and to feel, fear punishment. 
perhaps by a castration from their father. And he called this collection of feelings the Oedipus Complex after the Greek legend of Oedipus, who unknowingly killed his father and married his mother. How did Freud believe the child reduced the threat of the Oedipus Complex? So he thought eventually children cope with the threatening feeling of the Oedipus Complex by repressing them and then identifying, which means sort of trying to become like the rival parent. So for example, the, a, a young boy would, you know, repress those feelings of the Oedipus complex and then start identifying with his father. Through his, this identification process, children's super egos gain strength as they incorporate many of their parents' values. So the Electra complex, some psychoanalysis in Freud's era believed that girls experience a parallel to the Oedipus complex called the Electra complex, named after a mythological plotting daughter. As with the Oedipus complex, young girls in the phallic stage would seek to identify with their mother or stepmother in hopes of diffusing an un the unconscious tension. So Freud thought that identification with the same sex parent provided what psychologists now call our gender identity, our sense of being male, female, or some combination of the two. There's also a concept called fixation in psychoanalytic theory. According to Freud, a lingering focus of pleasure-seeking energies at an earlier psychosexual stage in which there are concept, conflicts that were unresolved is called fixation. In Freud's view, conflicts unresolved during earlier psychosexual stages could surface as maladaptive behavior into the adult years. At any point in the oral, anal, or phallic stages, strong conflict could lock or fixate that person's pleasure-seeking energies in that stage. So as an example, a person who had been either orally overindulged or deprived, you know, maybe by um, early weaning from breastfeeding, might fixate at the oral stage. The orally fixated adult could exhibit either passive dependence um, or an exaggerated denial of this dependence. Or the person might continue to seek oral gratification by smoking or excessive eating. So Freud proposed that the ego protects itself with what are called defense mechanisms, tactics that reduce or redirect anxiety by distorting reality. Um, so for example, regression would be an example of a de defense mechanism in which, re you know, retreating to an earlier psychosexual stage where some psychic energy remains fixated. So an example of that would be um, how a 16 year old would um, deal with defend against anxiety after being cut from the soccer team, okay? So wants to go to his grandma's house to play cards and eat her chocolate chip cookies. Now reaction formation is switching unacceptable impulses into their opposites. So our 16 year old who got cut from the soccer team would make a big show of expressing indifference about being on the stupid soccer team. Projection is disguising one's own threatening impulses by attributing them to others. So the 16 year old would talk a lot about how mad his parent is at the coach. Rationalizing, offering self-justifying explanations in place of re the real more threatening unconscious reasons for one's actions. So the 16 year old would explain that he wasn't working very hard in the tryouts and he could have made the team if he really wanted to, but he didn't. Okay, displacement would be shifting sexual or aggressive impulses toward a more acceptable or threatening object or per less, I'm sorry, toward a more acceptable or less threatening object or person. So if the 16 year old was cut, they might yell at his or her little brother for no real reason. Sublimation is transferring of unacceptable impulses into socially valued motives. So the 16 year old would decide instead to join the cross country team. Um, Finally, denial is refusing to believe or even per perceive painful realities. Uh, the 16 year old might insist that there was an error on the team list and he's going to set things right with the coach. So if you are taking the APA exam, the difference between these defense, defense mechanisms isn't that clear. For example, repression can be found in most examples. Focus on each example's key feature. If the key feature is seeing your own impulse in someone else, it's projection. If the key feature is shifting your aggression from one target to another, it's displacement. So what are defense mechanisms and how did Freud believe they function? So in psychoanalytic theory, there are the ego's protective methods of reducing anxiety. So they're trying, the, the function of the defense mechanisms is to reduce anxiety by unconsciously distorting what reality is. For Freud, all defense mechanisms function indirectly and unconsciously. 
So just as the body unconsciously defends itself against disease, so does the ego unconsciously defend itself against anxiety. Um, and we kind of went through all of these in that, in that chart, but repression again in psychoanalytic theory, the basic defense mechanism that banishes from the consciousness, anxiety arousing thoughts, feelings, and memories. For example, repression banishes anxiety arousing wishes and feelings from consciousness. To Freud, repression underlies all other of those defense mechanisms. Because repression is often incomplete, repressed, repressed urges may appear as symbols in dreams or as slips of the tongue in casual conversation. Like Freudian slips. You can take a sip of water, you can read the uh, cartoon. So Freudian slips. Freud believed he could glimpse the unconscious seeping through what we call, sleep, seeping through what we call, today call Freudian slips. Freud also viewed jokes as expressions of repressed sexual and aggressive tendencies. What about dreams? Freud viewed dreams as what he called the royal road to the unconscious. He thought that you could analyze them and understand what was going on within the unconscious. The remembered contest content of dreams was called the manifest content. He believed to be a censored expression of the dreamer's unconscious wishes, which was the dream's latent content. content. In his dream analysis, Freud searched for patients' inner conflicts. So after Freud, well, some of Freud's students um, here uh, were called the Neo-Freudians. These Pioneering psychoanalysts referred to as the Neo Freudians adopted Freud's interviewing techniques and accepted his basic ideas about personality, like the structures of id, ego, and superego, and the importance of unconscious, um, and the dynamics of anxiety and defense me mechanisms. But not, they didn't, they kind of split off with Freud in different ways. So Alfred Adler, um, who gave us the still popular inferiority complex idea, had struggled to overcome childhood illnesses and accidents. He believed that much of our behavior is driven by efforts to conquer childhood inferiority feelings that trigger our feelings, our strivings for superiority and power. Karen Horney uh, said childhood anxiety triggers our desire for love and security. She also opposed Freud's assumptions that women have weak super egos and suffer penis envy. And she attempted to balance his masculine ideas. Carl Jung may be his most famous uh, student. Uh, Jung believed that the unconscious contains more than our repressed thoughts and feelings. He believed we have what's called a collective unconscious, which is a common reservoir of images or archetypes, as he called them, derived from sort of species-wide universal experiences. So things like the hero and the rebel, the caregiver and the innocent are among the 12 archetypes that Jung believe reside within our collective unconscious as humans. Jung thought these 12 archetypes generate deep emotions and dominate the personality. Jung thought that the collective unconscious explains why, so for some many people, spiritual concerns are deeply rooted and why people in different cultures seem to share very similar myths, such as the flood myth and images. Most of today's psychologists discount the idea of these shared experiences, but they do believe that our shared evolutionary history did shape some universal dispositions and that this might be tagged within epigenetic marks that are affecting our genetic expression. So projective testing, what is that? A personality test that provides ambiguous images designed to trigger projection of one's inner dynamics. So a psychologist working in the Freudian tradition would require a personality test that could provide some sort of road into the unconscious mind to unearth the residue of early childhood experiences that are buried deep in there, move beneath the surface thoughts and reveal hidden conflicts and impulses. Objective assessment tools, such as agree, disagree, true, false questionnaires, wouldn't be adequate according to um, you know, a psychologist working in the Freudian tradition. So the thematic a perception test is the example of a projective test in which people express their inner feelings and interests through the stories they make up about ambiguous scenes. Um, it's called the TAT in practice. Um, the TAT in that uh, shown a daydreaming boy, those who imagine he's fantasizing about an achievement are presumed to be projecting their own goals. As a rule said Henry Murray, who developed the TAT, the subject leaves the test happily unaware that he has presented the psychologist with what amounts to an X-ray of his inner soul. 
Numerous studies suggest that Murray was right. The TAT provides a valid and reliable map of people's implicit motives. The Rorschach is probably the most famous of projective tests. It's often in different movies and stuff, and it's been around for a very long time. My grandmother, who was a school psychologist, actually used it a long time ago. Um, probably in the 1950s, she started using it. The most widely used projective test, a set of 10 ink blots designed by Herman Rorschach. It seeks to identify people's, people's inner feelings by analyzing their interpretation of the blots. So in the Rorschach, people tell what they see in a series of symmetrical ink blots. Some who use the test are confident that the interpretation uh, will reveal unconscious, get that, it'll be that road into the unconscious of the test taker's personality. Some clinicians cherish it, even offering assessments of criminals' violence behaviors. Others view the test as a sort of, of suggestive leads, an icebreaker or a revealing interview technique. So critics argue that only a few of the many Rorschach-derived scores, such as those for cognitive impairment and thought disorder, have demonstrated any reliability. The Rorschach definitely has problems with reliability. Ink plot assessments have inaccurately diagnosed many healthy adults as pathological, and even seasoned professionals can be fooled by their intuitions and their faith in tools that lack strong evidence of effectiveness. So both Freud's devotees and his detractors agree that recent research contradicts many of his specific ideas. Today's developmental psychologists see our development as lifelong, not fixed in childhood. They doubt that infants' neural networks are mature enough to sustain as much emotional trauma as Freud kind of assumed. Um, some think that Freud overestimated parental influence and underestimated peer influence. Um, further criticism of Freud. So um, just further, <laughs> psychologists further criticize for its scientific shortcomings, shortcomings, right? So if you remember all the way back to module five, that good scientific theories explain observations and offer testable hypotheses. Freud's theory rests on few objective observations and part of it offers few testable hypotheses. So for Freud, his own recollections and interpretations of his patients' free associations, dreams, and their Freudian slips, sometimes selected to and supported his theory, that was evidence enough for him, but right, that isn't truly science backing up what he was doing. So the most serious problem with Freud, it offers after-the-fact explanations of any characteristic of one person smoking, another's fear of horses, another sexual orientation, yet it fails to predict such behaviors and traits. So a good theory, if we think back to this early module, makes testable predictions. So for example, if you feel angry at your mother's death, you illustrate Freud's theory because your unresolved childhood dependency needs are threatened. If you do not feel angry, you again illustrate his theory because you're repressing your anger. So how do Freud's, Freud's supporters respond to these criticisms? Well, Freud's supporters object. To criticize Freudian theory for not making testable predictions is like criticizing baseball for not being an aerobic exercise. It wasn't what it was intended to be, according to Freud. He never claimed that psychoanalysis was a predictive science. He claimed that looking back, psychoanalysts could find meaning in our state of mind. So how has Freud's idea of reaction formation been supported in the research? So one study demonstrated, fairly recent, not that, that long ago, demonstrated the defense mechanism reaction formation in men who reported strong anti-gay attitudes. Compared with those who did not report such attitudes, those anti-gay men experienced greater arousal when watching videos of homosexual men. So likewise, some evidence suggests that people unconsciously identify as homosexual, but who consciously identify as straight, and they report more negative attitudes toward gay individuals. So how might Freud's theories have been correct? Research has supported Freud's idea that we unconsciously defend ourselves against anxiety. Researchers have proposed that one source of anxiety is the terror resulting from our awareness of vulnerability and death. So nearly 300 experiments testing that terror management theory so that thinking about one's mortality provokes various terror management defenses. So death and anxiety increases terror management defenses such as aggression towards rivals and esteem for oneself. Um, other research shows that faced with a threatening world, people act not only to enhance their self-esteem, but also to adhere more strongly to worldviews that answer questions about life's meaning. 
So what is terror management theory? It's a theory of death-related anxiety, it explores people's emotional and behavioral responses to reminders of impending death. So it's just kind of what it sounds like. Oops. So was Freud right about the unconscious? Freud was right about a big idea that underlies today's psychodynamic thinking. We have limited access to everything that's going on with our mind. So in that regard, yes, he, had, he was right on track. Our two-track mind has a vast out-of-sight realm. Some researchers even argue that most of a person's everyday life is determined by unconscious thought processes. Okay, finally back to the learning targets. Personality is an individual's characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. Okay, so psychoanalytic theory, which is later psychodynamic theory, and humanistic theory have become part of our Western culture. They laid the foundation for later theories such as trait and social cognitive theories of personality. Psychodynamic theories view personality from the perspective that behavior is a lively interaction between the conscious and unconscious mind. The theories trace their orig origin to Sigmund Freud's theory of psychoanalysis. So how did he come up? How did Freud come up with these ideas? When treating patients who disorder, whose disorders had no clear physical explanation, Freud concluded these were problems reflected unacceptable thoughts and feelings hidden away in the unconscious mind. To explore this part of the patient's mind, he used what he called free association and then the dream analysis um, you know, to get to that royal road of the unconscious. Freud believed that personality results from conflict among the, among the interaction between the mind's three systems, that id, ego, and superego. Freud also believed that children pass through those five psychosexual stages, the oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital stages. And according to this view, unresolved conflicts in any of those stages can leave a person's pleasure-seeking impulses fixated, which means sort of stalled, you get stuck at that stage. So for Freud, anxiety was the production product of tensions between the demands of the id and the superego. The ego copes by using unconscious defense mechanisms such as repression which he viewed as the basic mechanism underlying and enabling all others. Freud's early followers, um, many of who were students, the Neo-Freudians accepted many of his ideas, but they differed in places, placing emph more emphasis on the conscious mind and stressing social motives more than sexual or aggressive motives. Neo-Freudian Carl Jung, probably his most famous student, proposed the idea of the collective unconscious. Contemporary psychodynamic theorists and therapists reject Freud's emphasis on so sexual motivation. Um, they stress that the view that our much of our mental life is unconscious and they believe our childhood experiences influence our adult, person our adult personality and attachment patterns. Many also believe that our species shared evolutionary history shaped some of our universal predispositions. Um, today's psychologists do give Freud credit for drawing attention to the unconscious and its importance, to the struggle to cope with anxiety and sexuality, and to the conflict between impulses and social restraints, and for some forms of defense mechanisms. Research confirms that we do not have full access to everything that goes on our mind, right? So that idea of the unconscious. Today's science views the unconscious as a separate parallel track of information processing that's sort of occurring outside of our awareness. So schemas, perceptions, priming, implicit memories of learned skills, all those kind of things um, we could consider in this area. Oops, and that was the last slide. Let me go back. Um, that was a really long module. Thank you for listening and take care.